the Lord. Psalm 40. Before that, we're going to open up in a little prayer. Father, we just welcome you to this service. We're just are so grateful for being in your house. Better is one day in your house, one day in your courts, than a thousand elsewhere. And Lord, we are just so, so, so blessed and honored to be called your children, Lord. We just thank you for it all, Lord. We lift up the name Yeshua, Lord, because we know if you be lifted up, you draw all men to you. Lord, bring people in from the north, south, east, and west, and Lord, bring them here safely. Bless the service, bless the pastor, open the hearts that they can receive the word of God, Lord, and that they'll just worship in spirit and truth. And we just thank you for it all. In the name of Yeshua, we pray, amen.
In Luke 1, 33, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke 1, 33. He shall reign. the table set up this way and we're missing quite a few people as there's a dance event that uh, many of our musicians and dancers are attending nevertheless we are here and the Lord is here we, we have come to rendezvous with the spirit of holiness and um, uh, we're also glad that you came those who are here in person and those who are with us online uh, a Messianic congregation, uh, wherever they are, they consist of both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, and this, this event has waited 2,000 years. Um, think about it, that in the early biblical days of the Brit Kadashah, the New Testament, that there was um, a, um, a, there were congregations that consisted of Jews and Gentiles. Initially, uh, they were altogether Jewish, and, uh, but Gentiles began to trickle in, and it became so popular that um, the, the, the movement of faith got lodged with the Gentiles, uh, and, uh, and there were exclusions. The Jewish people tend, tended to exclude Gentiles, at, especially at that time, uh, and the reverse also. But now in the fullness of time, there is something new that is happening. Imagine if you were a monk uh, in the Middle Ages, you, you'd, you'd be sitting, sitting there poring over your 
literary references and so on and so forth on the Bible, and it would just seem like nothing changes. And surely they were reading this stuff about what was going to happen in the future, but it all seemed like a, such a mystery. Can it really mean what it says? But we who live in this age, we're living in it, and things are happening. And we don't have to wonder whether, whether, it is, uh, whether it is ever going to happen, because it's happening right here in our age. So uh, there's a scripture I wanted to uh, read here aloud this morning, uh, because it says something that um, we just kind of take for granted. But uh, this was uh, the year 712 BCE, the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 14 and verse 1 says, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob. It wasn't going to always be hard times for the Jews. And will yet have, choose Israel and set them in their own land. Well, that's happened. I mean, that's waited. I mean, that was said 2,700 years ago. And here it is happening in our, before our very eyes. And we're, and we're actually part of it. And it says, And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Well, isn't that a fulfillment? I mean, strangers, strangers, uh, uh, the ger is uh, another term for Gentile or the nations, strangers. So it says that uh, there's going to be favor set upon Israel, and it says that strangers will be joined, people who were not, uh, uh, their history is not with the, uh, as, uh, linear descendants of Jacob, but it says that these strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. This messianic enterprise uh, that is springing up all over the earth is something which was foretold in many scriptures and, uh, and is characterized by such an unusual event. I mean, it's very unusual looking over the panorama of time. Why should this have ever happened? Who would stimulate it? Certainly, the Jewish community, the traditional Jewish community, was not going to stimulate uh, a, a messianic movement. As a matter of fact, they were strongly against it. So how did it happen? How did it happen from out of nowhere? Well, was there a single leader other than Yeshua? No. Uh, were there, uh, w but there were people who, who they were believers. They had come to belief. And uh, most all of the Jewish believers, especially the early ones, but even to this day, there is a Gentile in the act. It is a Gentile that leads them to the Lord. It is a Gentile that creates the, the curiosity and interest. It is a Gentile who is presenting the scriptures. You see, God always had it in mind for the Jews and Gentiles to work together, yet holding to the distinction that uh, so long as there's this, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars fixed in their ordinance, there will always be a Jewish people. That distinctive must be held on to. God will see to it no matter what, because the fact that there are Jewish people is a testimony and brings glory to God. So that's going to be preserved. But the whole world is going to be drawn into this. The whole world's going to be drawn into it. And it's already underway. We are, we are the early ones. We are the early ones to catch on to it. And we are radicals. We're doing something that's different. And sometimes it costs people some, some good deal of uh, uh, reputation or, or uh, who knows? I mean, some people lose their clients uh, because they're thought to be just a little wacko. Okay. So... Uh, and you say, well, gee, the, the sanctions against Jewish people uh, uh, joining uh, of a New Testament congregation, there are sanctions against that, and it's very intimidating to some people. Their, their relatives and friends are not going to understand. But the same is true, the same is true among the Gentiles, because you're into what? Well, I don't understand this Masonic thing that you're, no, not that, it's not Masonic, it's Messianic. Yeah, that's what I said, Masonic. <laughs> and uh, uh, they, don't, they don't understand this. And so the Gentiles who, who, who even become believers, 
uh, let alone become part of a messianic movement, they're, th they're thought to be a little nutso. You're one of those religious fanatics, aren't you? Yes, indeed. I am a religious fanatic, and, and I mean to let people know about it. So, uh, glad, glad we could all attend, um, uh, though we're fewer in numbers today than usual. Uh, and uh, we usually start our service with the uh, blowing of the shofar. And, uh, and, and hmm? No. Yeah. Okay, we got two shofar blowers this morning. And Jerry Cohen will say a blessing over the blowing of the shofar. Numbers 10 says to call to assembly with the blowing of the shofar. Let's rise. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach and instructed us to hear the call of the Trufar. Amen. Standing and join me in the Shema via Hafta. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Machuto Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. V'yahavta et Adonai Elohecha, v'chol evecha, v'chol nashecha, v'chol miyodecha. V'hayu hadvarim ha'ele, ashe onochi mitzvacha, hayom alavavecha. Vashinantam livanecha, vidibarta bam, vashiftacha bavetecha, vuleftacha va derech, vashaf bacha uv kumecha, ushal tom leo ayadecha, vahayula tofot bene necha, uftatam almozozot petecha, uvisharecha. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. Speak of them when you're sitting in your house, when you're on the road, when you're lying down, and when you're rising up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be a symbol between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. komocha and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Baruchu et Adonai hamvorach, Baruch Adonai hamvorach leolam vayed, Baruch Adonai hamvorach leolam vayed, Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, Asher bachar bana mikol ha'amin, V'natalano et torato, Baruch ata Adonai, no tain ha Torah. Amen. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among the nations and has given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. I know he's here somewhere. There you are. Morning, Shabbat Shalom. 
So last week we were in chapter 11, or we ended with chapter 11, with uh, the laws concerning the clean and unclean animals. <clears throat> this week's Torah portion will be Leviticus chapters 12 through 13. Uh, chapter 12 deals with the purification after childbirth. There was a period of ceremonial uncleanliness for the Hebrew women. After bearing a male child, it was 40 days, and double that, 80 days, after bearing a female child, during which time... She was not allowed to touch anything holy or come to the sanctuary. After this purification time, the mother was to bring a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or dove for a sin offering uh, to the priest who would offer it up as an atonement for the woman so she'll be cleansed from her issue of blood. If she could not afford a lamb, uh, she could bring two young pigeons or dove, one for the burnt offering and one for the sin offering, which was done if in Luke 2.24 uh, for Yeshua. Uh, chapter 13, uh, these are the regulations concerning skin diseases. <clears throat> People with skin ailments were commit, or commanded to see the priest, Aaron and his sons. They would examine and declare whether it was clean or unclean, often shutting the person away in their house for seven days, then looking at it again to make a pronouncement on their condition. The chapter describes the conditions and actions to be taken concerning the plague of leprosy in a garment, house, <clears throat> or skin. <coughs> If a person was diagnosed with leprosy, they were to live outside the camp wearing torn clothes and having unkempt hair, and if found in a garment or animal skin, it was to be burned by the priest. Uh, so that concludes the Torah portion for today. Our Torah readings will be Leviticus chapter 13, verses 9 through 17. It's Leviticus 13, 9 through 17. When anyone has a defiling skin disease, they must be brought to the priest. The priest is to examine them. And if there is white swelling on the skin that was to turn the hair white, and if there is raw flesh in the swelling, uh, it is a chronic skin disease, and the priest shall pronounce them unclean. He is not to isolate them because they are already unclean. <clears throat> if the disease breaks out all over the skin, and so far as the priest can see, it covers all the skin, infected person from head to foot, the priest is to examine them. And if the disease has covered the whole body, he shall be pronounced him clean. Since it has turned white, they are clean. But whenever a raw flesh appears on them, they will be unclean. When the priest sees the raw flesh, he shall pronounce them unclean. If the raw flesh is unclean, they have a defiling disease. If the raw flesh changes and turns white, they must go to the priest, and the priest is to examine them. If the sores have turned white, the priest shall pronounce the affected person clean. Then they will be clean. <clears throat> Next, our half Torah reading. Stick it on the leprosy theme. It's 2 Kings 5, 1 through 19. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through 19. <clears throat> now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Nam went to his master and told him that the girl from Israel had said, By all means go, the king of Aram said. I have sent a letter to the king of Israel. So Nam left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him a message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Nahum went to his, with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will re be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Nahum went away angry and said, I thought he would come, surely come in, out and stand over me and call in the name of his Lord God and wave his hand over this spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? 
couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned away and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh, flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept the thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as two pairs of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices for any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord give, forgive your servant for one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. Amen. It's a good story. <clears throat> and finally, uh, <clears throat> our Brit Hadashav will be Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 40 through 45. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. A man with leprosy came and came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word. Boruchata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Ashe Natan Lano Torat Emet Vechai Olam Natabat Olchinu Boruchata Adonai No Tain HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who gave us the Torah of Truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. I guess it's Barbara's turn. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. <laughs> Good morning, Boker Tov. Welcome to Ohav Shalom Messianic Congregation in sunny, dry Palm Springs, California. And welcome to everyone also joining us online. And uh, we have a lot of things going on uh, during the week as well as Shabbat service is here now on Saturday. Um, the first and third Tuesday, we have a Bible study. And the second and fourth Shabbat, we have prayer, which is also going to be today after Oneg, which is our luncheon. And um, Thursday night, we have the wonderful street fair downtown, which today we have some friends that just were uh, visiting from Minnesota, Steve and Marjorie, right? So welcome, and we have a luncheon Oneg afterwards, and you're our guest first for that. And also our friends from Seattle, I think we have you a couple more weeks. Thank you again for coming. Everyone is welcome. Um, let's see, what else? Carol Slayton has the children's ministries here Saturday morning, as well as the second and fourth Wednesday, third and, is it the second and fourth? Okay, women's Hebrew word Bible study. Um, also the MJAA, which of course we belong to. We have a lot of ministries uh, through them. We've, we've presented lovely videos. I don't know if we have one today. Uh, we do. And did you want to show that now? During the offering. During the offering. Okay. Thank you. And um, also we have one more huge conference coming up uh, this summer in July, right around the 4th of July. 
uh, back in uh, Pennsylvania. It's a week long. It's fabulous. It's called uh, the Messiah Conference, and it's held at a college campus called Messiah. It's amazing. It's a wonderful experience. You get connected and you meet just about everyone internationally as well as nationally involved in the Messianic movement. So uh, join us for that. It's, it's an amazing experience. We want to lift up Father God, our congregation. Thank you for coming together uh, every Shabbat as we do, Father God, that you've provided for us. Thank you for all the blessings. We lift up our first responders, Father God, our military, our firefighters, our policemen, our caregivers, Father God, and I thank you for hearing these prayers and, and answering as well. We lift up our government, Father God. I would ask you to clean house. <laughs> and Father God, um, I lift up the Israeli Defense Forces, our wonderful military soldiers protecting our land of Israel. We lift up the hostages, Father God. I just ask that you bring them home. And it's in Yeshua's name that we pray and thank you. Amen. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. Romans 14, 11, and Isaiah 45, 23. Amen. Adonai.
Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Let the oil of gladness flow down upon you from your throne of grace. Thank you, Father. Terry? We used to do this song way back when, and when I was going through the book picking songs, I didn't know these ones were not familiar with it, so... Put on on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness.
you ever feel down or heavy, you don't know what to do, put on the garment of praise. Because when you praise the Lord, he lifts your head. And that's when we give thanks to the Lord, which yeah. we'll do right now. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Seek the Lord and his strength. Glory be to his name. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's Isaiah 25, 9. Anna Adonai. The theme is praising the Lord, seeking his face. Seeking his face, praising the Lord.
and Adonai. Lord, deliver us, I'm a Adonai. Turn your face toward us, I'm a Adonai. Lord, save us, I'm a Adonai. Lord, deliver us, I'm a Adonai. Turn your face toward us 
to come together as one body and exalt his name together. So please help us exalt his name. It's all about. Amen.
Good morning, saints. Glad to see you all here. If these lights get any brighter, I'll be blind by the end of this. <laughs> is there a way to turn those lights down, or is it impossible? <clears throat> anyway, um, can you put up uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38? <clears throat> so today, I wanted to talk a little bit about this chapter. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Yeshua, for the forgiveness of our sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, what that means to me is we're all looking for and need redemption. And where does redemption come from? How do we get redeemed? We have to repent. We have to sit in front of the Lord, get on our knees, do it in our prayer time, and say, hey, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. But I want your forgiveness. I want your redemption. And I don't think we think about that enough. How many think about daily redemption and daily repentance for anything we've done to anyone or against anyone or any type of sin? Because our flesh sinned. We're just natural born sinners. That's why we have Yeshua. And so <clears throat> I think the fact that we get redemption through Jesus, through living for him, having him in our heart, it gives us peace in life to go on, to, to fight the, the rough days. I decided today getting old is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> I said, God, you're killing me with kindness. <laughs> but seriously, you know, when you, when you wake up and your neck hurts and, and your, your feet hurt and your back hurts and everything hurts and, and you... You're going, well, okay, <laughs> how do we get rid of all this pain? And life can be painful. It really can be. So, you know, we're thankful to have redemption. We're happy that we can repent. And so I just ask you all to think about that today. And if you need to repent, join me after the service and we'll repent together. We can all pray together for repentance. Um, or the, the rabbi can offer it to everybody with a little prayer. But the focus of my life was getting married to a wonderful woman who brought me to the Lord. I was a stiff-necked Jew. And, and now I, I pray for our beloved Israel because when did they repent? Why haven't they repented? And I think it's up to us to work on that situation because they're in a world of trouble right now. And, you know, I used to think on Yom Kippur, okay, well, I'll repent today, my one day to repent. But that's not true repentance because we're not repenting to our Lord Yeshua. So I prayed that Israel repents because I, I can't see them ever living in peace. They've, they've had no peace for 2,000 years. And why? They haven't repented. So let's pray for Israel to repent, and, and let's just pray for ourselves in this congregation. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the repentance that you've given us. We thank you for the ability to live with you in eternity forever through that repentance. And we just pray for this congregation in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Baruch Atah 
Adonai, the Holy One who loves Elohim, you. Melech Haolam, your breath just fills the air now. You keep us here. Shahekianu, you keep us alive. The key of manu, sustaining our lives. Helping us reach this day. Shahekianu, the key of manu. are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, Holy One of blessing. You have kept us alive for such a time as this. So, it's a glory to God that we are meeting, that we all chose to come here today and to glorify God. Amen. Amen. It's really something. And, uh, you know, California is a place of uh, people, a lot of people feel alienation, alienation. And they can feel like, I don't got no friends. But actually, Friendships are formed by working together towards some common goal. And by working together, we get welded together uh, by the work, by whatever, whatever work that is. Uh, and um, and that's, that's where friendships come from. And the congregation is an ideal place. Uh, the body of Messiah is an ideal place for this welding together to, to happen. The, uh, uh, because we work together on common projects, work together on committees, and uh, I always feel like the people who don't stick around for uh, Onyx Shabbat are missing out on something. They're missing out on the fellowship. And um, there is a scripture, you know, by his stripes we are healed, but another translation that is, uh, by his fellowship we are healed. And, and we are in fellowship with each other and, uh, and when we're in fellowship with each other and Yeshua is part of that fellowship, it all works. It all works. So um, we have a children's class this morning. Not many children, but we have a class. 
So Carol, would you come forward, or Carol Slayton? And uh, uh, let's see, who am I gonna, who am I gonna pick on? Uh, <laughs> I'll pick on Lloyd and Sandra. Gotta have some tall people. Okay, and Lloyd, you got a, a booming voice, so why don't you lead in prayer? Isn't the, isn't the word, the Bible, something that uh, is, there are no inconsistencies in it. And uh, we can rely upon it to be firm and strong and consistent. And so uh, it becomes our, our constitution, so to speak. It's our constitution on a spiritual level. We have a, a national constitution on a material and physical level, and we have a constitution uh, on, uh, on a spiritual level. Yeah, well, um, and I sometimes think that our physical constitution of the United States was patterned after the Bible. Because in the Bible, you know, we had, uh, we had an executive branch. We have people who, who make decisions on behalf of the community. And uh, uh, we have uh, a court system uh, because there has to be some uh, possibility of obtaining, of seeking justice. And legislation, the legislation is all, all here. It's all written. But Sometimes it needs interpretation because the individual circumstance, we need to see how to apply the scriptures. So the Bible is really quite an amazing book and we count on it, we count on it. It took a long time for the canonization to take place to decide which, which scriptures are in and which ones are out. And the criteria was, does it have an anointing about it? Does it show prophetic things? So let's pray that uh, the Lord will uh, speak to us uh, through his word and by his Holy Spirit. Please join me. <clears throat> oh Lord, how wonderful thou art. You meet us in every circumstance. And though there are many things that are contrary and seem difficult, we know that you do come through for us every time, every time. It may not be the way that we wanted or asked for, but you, you are after our good in every circumstance. Give this message today, anoint your word, and we'll pray in thanksgiving, amen. So, uh, today I'd like us to go over a, a, a chapter that, um, uh, Luke chapter 19. And we'll start with the first verse of this chapter. <clears throat> Is everybody turned to the right page? Yes, I see that. <laughs> and it says, <clears throat> And Yeshua entered and passed through Jericho. So um, it's always nice to say some of the uh, historical bric-a-brac, the, the things that uh, are in the Bible, but not dwelt upon that much. Uh, Jericho 
Uh, for those who have been to Israel will recall that Jericho was uh, one of the first cities that uh, uh, the, he the, Hebrew, the Hebrews led by Moses uh, or Joshua came upon. And it uh, isn't much of a city. It, but what it is, is it is, a, it is and has been a thriving oasis. So, uh, but it's far, it's far away. I mean, you just don't pick yourself up and go from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's, especially if you're on foot or on a donkey. It's a long, it's a long way. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So, um, he was, what's a publican? Is that, is that a drinker? No, it's not a drinker. That is, a, that is somebody who is a tax collector. A tax collector was what's referred to as, as publicans, acting on behalf of the public, so to speak. But it says here he was the chief among the publicans. So he was the chief tax collector. That meant that there were other tax collectors, all right, and he was over them, which meant that he got an override on what they collected. So let's make up a figure. Let's say, let's say that uh, Rome had a 5% tax. Well, um, the local tax collector could not only collect the 5%, but could put it in a markup. And it would be a markup of whatever the tax collector said. And some tax collectors were really greedy. And, uh, you know, they, they could make a 10% instead of 5% or 15%. But that was up to the tax collector. Tax collector had to be careful that, that you didn't go bankrupt and, uh, and, and no longer would be producing. But you can understand why there was great resentment uh, against the tax collectors who were collecting on behalf of Rome. Was it legitimate for Rome to collect taxes from uh, the people in Israel? Well, government does have to function. It does have to function. And uh, if, if nothing else, the number one thing that the government is supposed to do is to provide a defense, to provide order, and that's expensive. So there's, you know, there's the military or the police department, or, but there has to be order in order for there to be a society. And, uh, and there has to be some, some way of adjudication of grievances. Uh, so there, there's various functions of government that, um, that are needful and need to be supported by taxes. We're gonna remember that on April 15th, aren't we? And joyfully and gleefully, we will run to pay our taxes. <laughs> you know, in Israel, you don't, there is a, uh, you don't fill out a, a tax return. People do not have tax returns. The government takes it at the source. So before you get your money, the tax collector, the taxes have already been taken out. So it's, uh, it, that's to preclude any, any cheating on the government. But it's very efficient, very efficient. In verse 3, it says, And he sought to see Yeshua, who he was, and could not for the press. It's very crowded. Uh, and he was little of stature. And he ran before, that's be before the crowd, and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for which he was to pass that way. So he can't see, he can't, he can't see Yeshua because he's so small. And uh, so he... He sees a, a, a possibility out a short distance away. Uh, the, Yeshua and the crowd are going to have to pass by this sycamore tree. I can climb the sycamore tree and, 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 uh, and overcome my smallness. By the way, what, what is it, why is it important that it says a sycamore tree? A uh, sycamore tree is a symbol of... Uh, of spiritual seeking. Things that are pertaining to spiritual are thought to be, uh, that's a, sim a biblical symbol. As a matter of fact, long tradition has it that the tree of life was a sycamore tree. 
Okay. And when Yeshua came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come now, come, come down for, the day, for this day. I must abide in your house. How did Yeshua know of Zacchaeus? It doesn't say that Yeshua frequented Jericho. He just, it, he was there. But had he visited before, did he know Zacchaeus? There's no evidence of that. But he knew Zacchaeus. They maybe had, they had never met, but he knew Zacchaeus, he knew his name. How did he know that? By the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of Messiah is the Holy Spirit. And, and he, that must have been quite a shock, a very a big surprise to Zacchaeus to realize that this miracle man who's going around, this important individual, is, um, he knows my name. That would be impressive. Suppose, suppose you were Zacchaeus and you're going along and nobody's paying any attention to you, you're the shrimp. And what's more, you're despised by all the people. Um, but this, this Yeshua, he knows my name. That, that would be an indication that there's something supernatural going on here besides the healings, that he knows my name. That's, that's miraculous, that's supernatural. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Interestingly enough, in verse five, it says, I must abide at your house, I must. So you would think that Yeshua would have options, but the way Yeshua is expressing it, he's saying, I have to, I must, it's required of me to come to your house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man who was a sinner. But Zacchaeus is hated, despised everywhere. He's the chief tax collector. And yet Yeshua wants to have dinner with him and says, I have to have dinner with you. And Zacchaeus in verse eight, stood and said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restored him fourfold. Hmm. So let's assume that, you know, how, how is it that uh, s suddenly there's this uh, relationship out of seemingly nowhere. It wasn't as though every other week that Yeshua goes down to Jericho a long distance. And then what's the chances that they have a relationship pr prior, to, prior to this occasion? Probably not. We have no indication that, that any prior relationship existed. It says that, um, but then this tax collector, I mean, money is his life. That's his, not only his occupation, but that's what makes him tick. He's known as the money guy, the money guy. And suddenly from out of nowhere, this money man who's lived his life focused on money and collecting taxes, he says, I'm gonna give half, I'm gonna give half my money away right now. Why? Because he, because it, it, there was, there was something perhaps in Yeshua knowing his name from out of the blue that uh, was an indication to him. Hey, this, this is, this is a supernatural man. And what's more, if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Hmm. What's this fourfold business? Fourfold comes up twice in the scriptures. You see, they all knew, they, they knew their scriptures. Zacchaeus knows the scriptures, Yeshua knows the scriptures, and others know the scriptures. It is we in the 21st century who don't know so much about the scriptures, but they did, they did. So let's, uh, let's find out when, do, when what, what's, this, what's this fourfold business? That's an unusual thing. I mean, not, he's not only giving half his money to the poor, but if I've cheated anybody, 
I'm going to give them fourfold of the amount that I cheated them. Okay? So in 2 Samuel 12, 6, we see an example of this. This uh, refers to the time of David um, and uh, being uh, approached by Nathan the prophet. And Nathan the prophet says, uh, tells him, he says that there's a man and, and uh, you know, and, and, and took everything from him. And, and David says, well, who's this man? And he says, this man deserves, deserves punishment under the scriptures. He says, so he says to, uh, to Nathan the prophet, he says, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he hath no pity. Well, Nathan says, you're the man. So it was now, it was now up to David to restore to Uriah's family fourfold, fourfold of a life that was squandered in order to avoid an accusation about with Bathsheba. So, but here's the principle of fourfold. It was a scriptural, it wasn't that Zacchaeus from out of nowhere came up with a fourfold. No, he knew the requirement. So he's doing two things. He's saying, um, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give away half my half my fortune. But he's also saying, beyond that, if I if if I have cheated anybody, if I have, if I've done anything that, that was this that was dishonest, why I'm gonna restore fourfold. So if there's an accusation against me by anybody who says that I cheated them, let them make their accusation and let's, and, 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 and let's adjudicate it. And if I have cheated, why, it's up to me to pay fourfold. So he's saying two things, take half my fortune and restore, and I'm willing to restore four, fourfold. So it may, it sounds like generosity, but maybe he was just sure that he had never, that he hadn't, that he was not cheating people. It's also mentioned in uh, chapter 22 of the book of Exodus. Uh, <clears throat> the first verse says, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep or kill it and sell it, he shall restore fivefold, five oxen for an ox and four sheep for sheep. So, so if, so the, uh, the Torah says that restoration is fourfold if the accusation is correct. So that's, that's where Zacchaeus got the idea of the fourfold. And this was known, this was known um, in, in, the, in the community. So we have, uh, we have our reason for Zacchaeus being so generous. And let's get back to Luke chapter 10. And Yeshua said to him, this day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The repentance of Zacchaeus was very meaningful. A guy whose life basically functioned all about money. His identi identity is all tied up with his money. And he's willing to give half of his half of the all of his money to um, the poor and the fourfold recompense. Hmm. Gee, wonder what uh, what the new covenant could say uh, in addition to any of this. Well, we can turn to Romans eight twenty nine. And Romans 8, 29, <clears throat> for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's us. Yeshua was the firstborn among many believers. That's us. So you too are considered to be a son of God or a daughter of God. And it seems as though that there's some sort of uh, thing going on here 
uh, but whom he did predestinate. So that's why, you see, it was, the story sounds like it was important for Zacchaeus to get a view of Messiah. But according to, from Yeshua's point of view, it was important to see and give, to, to see Zacchaeus. Because Yeshua knew that Zacchaeus was to be one of these that was predestined to become a believer. And not only to be predestined, but in that predestination, that to be conformed to the image of his son, Yeshua. So that is, so Yeshua knows that about Zacchaeus. He not only knows his name, but he knows about him. And that's why Yeshua says, I must, I have to. It's, I'm called upon to, um, to seek him, and I, and I have to come to your house. He didn't wait for an invitation. He just says, I got to come. And it's important. So <clears throat> Yeshua knows that Zacchaeus, he sees this, he sees this tax collector, a man despised by the population. And um, Yeshua knows that he is um, <clears throat> pre predestined to become a believer. That's why I got to go to your house. I want to see your, I want to meet you. I want to meet your family. Um, we got to talk. We got to talk. And so, based upon this uh, Yeshua's uh, <clears throat> requirement to, uh, to, to bring this predestined individual to, ma to manifest his, pre his predestination. So, think about it. <clears throat> We, in common parlance, we say, I found the Lord. I found the Lord. But the reality of it is, the reality of it is, is the Lord found us. That's how it really works. Okay. So, the Lord predestines who's going to become a believer. You may differ with that, but I, but I bring you to the scripture that we just read about, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> For he did foreknow and did predestinate to be conformed unto his image, the, the Son. So this business of becoming a believer because you were predestined to become a believer, if you differ with that predestination, why well, take it up with um, Romans 8.29. So, how does this predestined to become a believer work? Well, you know, the world is wondering how does how does it how does how does it work? What what is this life all about? What is this life all about? What am I supposed to do with it? Am I just supposed to gratify my flesh and and and, and do what I feel like doing? It's got to be more to it than that. But <clears throat> the world finds it's a grand mystery. But Bible believers, we we can know many of the mysteries of life. And if we, if we pursue it, there are certain things we can learn about it. For example, we learn that at the beginning of things that there was a war in heaven and Lucifer was an upstart who wanted to share the throne with God. After all, didn't I help you bring about all of these things? Uh, I mean, before there was matter, there, they say that there's gases that congealed and, 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 and that that matter go, was uh, <clears throat> reformulated again and again and again. And, and, then, and then there was the, the animals and the plants all to provide a support system for mankind. Because though it may have been eons of time, that which was important to the Lord was to, was to settle up with Lucifer. Lucifer was a rebel, and he would, he would, he, he, he was, in an unauthorized way, rising above what he was created to do. He was attempting to rise above what he was created to do. And so, the Lord, the, the big thing with the Lord is this war in heaven. 
And so he wants to put the devil down. And how is he going to put the devil down? Well, he was going to elevate man who was created a little lower than the angels and elevating him to a station above the angels. Why? Because we as believers have run the gauntlet of life and acted in faith, and that's something that the devil can't do. Therefore, we will have shown ourselves to be the, most, the more noble creation than the angel class. And that's what God is doing, and that's, that's part of the big picture. The big picture is God is settling up with the devil. It goes all the way back to that, to put the devil down. And now, finally, finally, after, I suppose, a, a very, very long time, man appears on, on the earth. And that's for a reason, because it's going to be man who is going to be the agent to overcome the devil. And so God predestined certain individuals to be warriors on God's behalf to help put the, the, the devil down. And how is this going to take place? By faith. By faith. The devil cannot exhibit faith. The angels know what's going on. We have to, we have to <clears throat> do it by faith. The evidence of things unseen. So now mankind appears on the earth, but God's in no hurry. And he wants to establish who this, how is this going to take place? There's a lot of people. And they're all sinners. We got to have somebody who will be, who will represent, who will represent mankind. But that representative can't be impure. It will have to be a Messiah by supernatural birth so that the sins of the fathers are not visited on the sons of the third and fourth generation at all. No, it would have to be somebody, okay, who had a special father to carry the special, <clears throat> the special Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, the Spirit of Yeshua would come, and by that pure holiness, he would show himself to have risen above the devil, that which the devil can't do, won't do. Yeshua showed himself to, be, to have bested the devil, to have bested him in the contest, which is going to win the pure hatred or the pure love, and the pure love won. And so forever and all times, the devil must bow down to his superior. But God wants him put down more than that. God wants it to be that all of mankind will rise above. And so it's out there in the future that there will be there will be believers, individuals along the way who are going to be instrumental in putting the devil down. That's us. You may, not, you may say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know where, I don't know where it's all going and uh, what the meaning of life is. This is the meaning of our lives. This is why we were born into this life. The scriptures say, before, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before, before you were a zygote, before you were an embryo, before you were born, I knew you. So you see, before, before there was a, the, the meeting of the spermatozoa and the ovum, okay, before the congealing into a physical entity, God knew us. We are actually eternal beings. And God knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. So he knew us. He knew what we were about. He knew, he knew of our character yet to be developed. And so in this life, we're going through a process of the development of our character and being warriors on God's behalf. So this is the big picture, uh, so to speak, about why we're here and what we're doing. So the main game, the main game is I was born into this life, and why? To bring glory to God. That's it. Everything else is a subcategory. 
The main thing, the main deal is, is we were born into this life with a destiny. And that destiny was known to God as we were known to God before even a material conception. Man, that goes way back, doesn't it? We don't even know how far back that goes. But we were known. And God knew us, and he knew what was going to happen because he knew our destiny. So we are each playing out a preordained destiny for the purpose of glorifying God. So all, the, all of the things that we do are either glorifying God or not glorifying God. You know, this whole thing about predestination is a tricky business, and people don't like to discuss it because it seems unfathomable. I take a very simple-minded approach. Very simple-minded approach. Let me see. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they are they're in swell, they're in great shape with God. And they do what God says, and that's it. That's life in the Garden of Eden. Hey, we just do what God says, everything goes well. But Eve and then Adam, they decided to do what I refer to as free will. So if the purpose of life is strictly speaking for the purpose of glorifying God, then every time I step out of the will of God, and that's what I'm doing when I'm in my free will, why then, that's when, I mean some people would call that sin, stepping out of the will of God. So when I am stepping out of the will of God, stepping out of my predestined character, and life events, well, <clears throat> okay, yeah, there's going to be consequences, sowing and reaping consequences for stepping out of God's will. The things that don't work is when we step out of God's will. When we're walking in God's will, things work. They're authorized. God's backing us, and so on. So, so we have, we have this situation where um, we're born into this life for the purpose of glorifying God, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. When we don't, and we step out into what we want, what's our free will, what we, what our will is, then that's, in some people's estimation, that's sin. Okay. And which we all do. So, so but we were in need of a representative who could, who could, who had the authority, and we got to get in on his package. And so, he knew us. Yeshua knew us before we were conceived in our mother's womb. And then we went into the, a new stage. And the new stage was we became a zygote. And then, and then we graduated to becoming an embryo. And then we graduated to being a baby. Oh, my goodness. What happened to the predestined children, 60 million of them, that got aborted? What happened to them? Did their spirit die? No. They may, they may, their physical future may have been precluded, but their spiritual future was not necessarily killed off. So they are out there. Those spiritual beings, 60 million of them, are out there somewhere. They may have gotten physically killed, but they are, as spiritual beings, like other spiritual beings like us, we continue to exist, and we went on to another stage. They were precluded from getting to that next stage called birth. But then we continue along in our development, and we, we go from birth to childhood, from childhood to development as teenagers and so on, and then adults, and then old age. Bing, bing, bang, and it's over. We count it as so much, such high, oh my goodness, I have to achieve, I have to do this, I have to do that. But the reality is, the reality is that there is a predestination for all of us, and we have all been chosen. God thought that each and every one of us was important enough to choose us 
to choose us from among the multitude, to choose us and say, uh, that one, that one, yeah, I knew, I knew her before, before she was in her mother's womb. Yeah, I know it. She's, she's, she's meant, she's meant to help in this, in this spiritual, moral drama. And the son of God who has, who has the same, who is the same Holy Spirit as God the Father, he knew her too. And, and, and based upon that, he's been given a charge. He's been given a charge uh, to, like, uh, that he must, he must be in contact and deal with um, uh, Zacchaeus. In Romans, the ninth chapter, and the 11th verse, it says, For the children not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Again, here we have a situation where predestination is, is spoken of in the new covenant. Being not yet born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Neither having done any good or evil. You haven't been born yet, but God knows your destiny. That the purpose of God, according to elections, might stand. So this whole setup of who you are was organized before the foundations of the earth. Your destiny was known to Yeshua. A way back when? before you even did any good or evil. But God knows which are the ones that are going to do good and which are the ones that are going to do evil. And so, we were born into this life, and the question is, were we one of those that was born to do good? Well, obviously, we were chosen. We're here. We're here. And, uh, it feels darn good to be one of the chosen, one of the chosen. You know, um, the, uh, I've always liked the song from the film Casablanca. Maybe you, maybe you remember Casablanca, I think it was the 1941 production with Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, Any, anybody old enough to remember it? Yeah. Come on, don't be bashful. We know you're old enough. Okay. So, the, the song, it says, you must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The world will always welcome lovers. It says, it's a fight for love and glory. That's what it is. It's a fight for love and glory. Ladies and gentlemen, Men want glory. That male component, that's what men are all about. They want to be a somebody. They want to be admired. They want, they want to uh, have achieved something. The men want glory. Yes, they want security too, but that's second on the list. Now the women, which are typified in being the bride of Messiah, okay, they're the, as, a, as a bride, we're part of the the female component here. And uh, so that's what women want. When women, sure, they want, they want glory. But more important is to have security. God, we're made in the image of God. And just like we men are questing after glory, God is questing after glory. And the main moral issue in the universe is this thing, are we going to be on the side of those, of those who are going to be assisting God in putting the devil down? And thereby, we get a reflected glory. On the female side, the body of Messiah, okay, that's the church. And we want to be loved. We want to be loved. That's the main thing that we want is to be loved as, as members of the universal congregation. So these are, 
These are things that this, this issue of predestination is mentioned here again, that this is what we were born to do. This is why, this is why we were born into this life. If anybody has a question as to why, why was I born? To bring glory to God. God wants glory. He's not a glory hound in the negative sense, but he wants to get credit for what he's done and how good he is, etc. And so he doesn't want to, he, he, he does not want to share that with the devil. So we have been recruited and we have been trained and Yeshua sought us. It wasn't as though by my brilliance I became a believer because I read the scriptures and because I did this and because I did that. Give me credit for becoming a believer. No, it didn't have to do with that. It had to do with, the, with Yeshua, knew our name, saw our destiny, recruited us, and said, follow me. And what did we do? We said, okay. And that okay was a big deal for him because it showed that we had confidence in him rather than the slander that had befallen him in the new covenant. Fi finally, finally, Ephesians 1, 4. According, he has chosen us. See, he chose us. That's how it worked. He says, accordingly, he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So here's, a, here's, a, here's a, another scripture about, about being chosen and being uh, and that this was done before the foundations of the earth. Before there was an earth, before there was dirt, there was the foundations to help make the dirt and the rocks and all the rest of it. All of this, the perfect, the perfect integration of just the right amount of oxygen and the, and the, right, the right amount of light and the, the right amount of carbon dioxide the right amount for plant life, all of that was, was all of the creation was a support system for mankind because mankind had to exist and there had to be plenty of us, plenty of warriors out there. And so God created this entire universe with the idea being that it would provide a support system from now and from now on. And that support system is still going on. So that was the, that's the purpose of the creation, was a support system for man, because man's function was to bring glory to God by the putting down of the devil. I want an amen for that one. Amen. All right, all right, amen. So, uh, we're getting the picture. Is this not the big picture of life? We can know, we can know about how things work and what the purpose of things are. The scriptures tell us, here we just, we just found these scriptures about, about predestination and, and that the predestination goes back even before the foundations of the earth and before we were formed in our mother's womb. Uh, we know that. And we don't have to take Paul, we don't have to take my word for it either. What we gotta do is we gotta take the Bible's word for it. Oh, people say, I believe, I believe in God. Oh yeah, but do you believe what God says? That's the measure. Do you believe in what God says? Oh, I can believe that there's a universe and it was somehow magically created and so on and so forth. That's not real belief. There's no faith in that. No, to be, to be acting in faith is to say, I got, enough, I got enough clues, I got enough evidence to say, yeah, I think it's right. Uh, I can't know for certain but I know enough to, to bet, to bet on it, to bet that it's true and act upon it. And in the acting upon it, we find our character. When we act upon the things of God, it says something about our character. It says, in the moral question, the moral question of the universe, where did I stand? And did I put my shoulder to the wheel to help and assist in making 
God's glory and, and God's victory a sure thing. See, we got important work to do, and we have been doing it. It may seem as though, man, I'm having a rough time. Yeah, well, that's, that was all for the refining of your character. God's working on you. He's working on your character because that character that is being refined through trial, okay, that's what you're taking to heaven, nothing else. Huh? You're going, you're going and, and the character will be where I stand in God's quest to deal with the devil. That's the moral question. And we have made our decision. And now that we've, we haven't really maybe known exactly why, but now by reading the scriptures, God has told us. God has told us about predestination, and he's told us about the things we spoke of here this morning. So I think, uh, I think God's got a, a good, thoroughgoing plan, okay? Thoroughgoing plan, and he has disclosed it to us. If we'll pay attention, he has disclosed to us these secrets about life and the big expanse of what we were born into. We got the big picture. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> you are a great God. And we are, we are so happy that you knew us even before we were born. And Lord, we do thank you that you could see so much further than us and that you had a good life set up for us. And Lord, we trust you. We trust that even in those times when we don't understand or it doesn't seem fair, that we still will say, I trust you, O Lord. You are trustworthy. We'll pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Okay. Call on Jerry Cohn. He's going to lead us in Ain Kelohano. There we go. We're, we're good. All right. If everybody join me in Ankeloheno. Ankeloheno, Ankadonenu, Ankemalkenu, Ankemoshienu, Mikeloheno, Mikadonenu, Mikemalkenu, Mikemoshienu, No del Elohenu, No del Adonenu, no del malkenu, no del amoshienu, baruch eloheinu, baruch adonenu, baruch malkenu, baruch amoshienu, atahu eloheinu, atahu adonenu, atahu malkenu, atahu moshienu. There's none like our God. There's none like our Lord. There's none like our King. There's none like our Savior. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Savior? Let us thank our God. Let us thank our Lord. Let us thank our King. Let us thank our Savior. Blessed is our God. Blessed is our Lord. Blessed is our King. Blessed is our Savior. It is you who is our God. It is you who is our Lord. It is you who is our King. It is you who is our Savior. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.